Hi, this is Scott from SaaS Startup Stories, and today's show is sponsored by Active Campaign, the world's number one email marketing and automation platform, and it's a system that I use to run my entire business. If you'd like to get started with Active Campaign and take advantage of the best current promo they're running, then go over to scottdolly.com forward slash AC and fill out the form. And today, my special guest is Alexis Kinsbury. Alexis is based in the UK, and he's the co-founder at Air Manual, which is a platform that helps organisations share processes, training, and roll onboarding in a format that actually works. Alexis, you ready to rock and roll? Absolutely, I am. Thanks very much for having me, Scott. You're welcome. All right, let's get stuck into it. And we'll start off with your background and what initially got you interested in starting a SaaS company. Yeah, sure. So as a even as a young kid, like 11, 12, 13 years old, I was always sort of fascinated by um, working and uh, business. And uh, particularly when I got my first computer, like playing around on the Internet and even starting to build websites. So I always loved tech as a, as a world, gadgets and being able to build stuff. Um, so that really kind of meant that I was probably destined to go to SaaS business. Um, but um, for the first few years of me wanting to work and build businesses, um, I, I, I guess I kept on thinking, right, you know, I want to, I want to build a big business. But I couldn't work out how. Whenever, whenever things would go well, I'd get busy, and then I couldn't scale the business beyond just me. Um, and so I kind of got the feast and famine, even you know, even in my first few years, and even while, you know, when I was at university, I was again running different businesses, and I kept on thinking it was the business model. So I would change the product. I'd switch from uh, whether it was washing cars when I was really young, or uh, selling headsets, or building and selling yeah. computers. Like I kept on changing the product whereas i now realized that wasn't the issue like it was how i was doing the business um but uh, to try and learn i went uh, i went well i went to uni and studied management science i became a, a management consultant at pa consulting worked with really large businesses like astrazeneca and honda and bp and uk government and so on and um, helping them to sort out their biggest problems and i learned that the way that they were able to deliver at scale and you know it's not like um, it's not like Honda is basically managed by one person and, you know, there's a couple of VAs, like it's huge, huge operation. <laughs> um, and I learned that the way that they do that is people and processes and, uh, uh, and processes regardless of whether they're written down or not. But it's like there is a way of doing things and that's how they're able to make sure that the people they bring into the business add value and that they're able to grow. And so um, having learned that and as a consultant, learning how to improve processes, particularly because a lot of the work I was doing was documenting processes and so on. Um, I, uh, I then left to start my own consultancy with my uh, business partner who I met there. And, um, but we always had the aim of creating a software business. I think um, partly we'd read uh, uh, Tim Ferriss's um, four hour work week and were kind of inspired to create a business that doesn't depend on us. You know, early on we were kind of thinking, yeah, you know, when we've got families, we don't want to have to work to earn every every pound that we we earn, um, and uh, and be, kind of be chained to the business. So we and we really like the the idea of these new SaaS businesses, these software as a service like you know uh, uh, recurring revenue models that just seem really attractive. And so we thought, well, okay, this this is what we what we want to do, and particularly because both of us had sort of techy geeky type backgrounds that you know uh, loved uh, loved it and so it was a kind of natural fit for us um i think you know if i was to go pat then what it, based on what i've learned now i think it's entirely possible to build even consulting businesses that don't depend on you uh, as i've kind of learned since but i didn't know that at the time um but i there's a lot to love about SaaS businesses in terms of your ability to scale your impact and the get bits that you get to play with and the way in which you can structure the business and make so much of it um, not dependent on you is really, really enjoyable. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that got me interested and uh, I haven't really looked back since. Sounds good. All right. So by the sound of it, you're a non-tech founder. Is that right? That's right. I mean, yeah. Yes, in the sense that I have never done any coding of our products. Yeah. Um, yep. I'm probably techier than many non-tech founders because um, back when I was 
uh well pre-uni was, you know when i when i was at school i was writing html i remember um, <laughs> I, I took an a level in uh, uh which is like uh, when i was about uh, 17 18 um uh, i was taking an a level in it alongside business studies and some other courses i was doing and i remember uh, that they were essentially wanting us to learn like microsoft word and learn excel and powerpoint and bear in mind by that time i w had already completed like e-learning modules <laughs> on those things and was you know building macros and writing html code and learning javascript and stuff um and so i uh chose uh, unwisely uh, to instead spend my IT lessons in the sixth form common room playing Nintendo 64, um, which when my teacher came in and said, what are you doing? I kind of pointed at the screen and said, IT? Um, yeah, and wasn't allowed to remain on that particular course. So I have got an IT background <laughs> and, uh, and I've always been a bit geeky in that respect, but yeah, I, I, don't, I haven't done, I haven't continued that into coding in, in, our, in our businesses. So who does the coding? Is that your partner or have you got employees? So in the early days, it was my co-founder, Paddy. But then uh, we, with our first SaaS business, which was Spider Gap, we started hiring developers and, and now have a team of developers uh, in, in that business. And then uh, in the last few years, we started Air Manual, uh, again, starting off with Paddy and then uh, hiring yeah. developers. And so now we, yeah. have a, we have a team. So in both, in both sides... Uh, and both products, we now have teams for both sales, yeah. customer success, uh, development, and, and so on. Perfect. All right. So was Air Manual bootstrapped or did you get VC funding? Tell us how you got the business off the ground. Yeah, so we've always been bootstrapped across all of our businesses. Um, uh, I think for, for a few reasons. I think, one, um, we we wanted to, uh, you know, there was a component a little bit like when I was talking about four hour work week, there was a component of kind of thinking we want a lifestyle business. Like we want the ability to be able to take six weeks holiday, uh, as I did this year, um, on a road trip with my family across the summer and just go and enjoy that and not feel like I've got someone saying, Hey, what are you doing? You know, what are, you're meant to be hitting some milestones. I, you know, I don't want you swanning off. Um, mm. And so both Paddy and I, you know, wanted to make sure that there was there was no one above us in that time. And particularly, particularly five to ten years ago, the the space or, or, and certainly our perception of the space around VC and equity and all that kind of stuff was that you know it was the hard taskmasters and that there was a heavy expectation that you know you're going to be working evenings, weekends, you're going to be you know eating chicken ramen in a and working out of a garage, and that that's how SAS found uh, you know foundership is done <laughs> um and we uh hated every part of that and the idea of doing that whilst you've got a partner and young family uh, which we have done whilst growing our businesses um you know uh, paddy has three kids i've got two and um uh, ten today actually at the day of recording my uh, it's my 10-year wedding anniversary to my amazing wife and those things are incredibly important to us um in, yeah. in fact, on our, our own uh, podcast uh, uh, on de-stress your business, we were literally talking today about um, uh, like uh, why we ask our customers, what's your life changing goal? Because I think it's so important to be clear on, you know, what really matters to you. And so what our worry with taking on funding would be that that would pull us away from that in ways that we wouldn't want. I think the current climate of funding is different. I think it's improved over the years. And I think there's a greater appreciation of not burning out the entrepreneurs that you're investing in. Um, uh, although uh, I, I don't have enough experience of it to know how that varies and how that, uh, that's actually applied in practice. I hear, I hear better stories. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was, that was why we did that. And so, yeah, we've been bootstrapped for Spider Gap, we had to fund it through doing consulting work to give us enough money to, to grow it. And then for Air Manual, we essentially, over the years, built up a bit of a war chest through Spider Gap and uh, built up a cash pile, which then we kind of invested over a period of about 18 months um, before we uh, got to uh, got to break even in, in that business and, and so on. So, um, yeah, that's how we've done it for each of those. Nice. All right, so you've done it twice, but would you say there's anything you would change about your approach if you had to do it all over again? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Both times around. <laughs> so the, I'd say that the, the first time around with, with Spider Gap, the one of the things that we tried to do way too early was um, kind of manage by metrics. 
you know, at the, at the time we'd re, we'd been reading books like Lean Startup and Four Hour Work Week and all these sorts of books that that it's like there was heavy encouragement and and possibly misinterpretation on our part. So you know, to be fair to the authors, but it felt like there was encouragement to you know get clear on your metrics and then you know work out each part of the funnel and da 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 da. And we just started that too early. Whereas what we should have been doing was getting initial customers and and proof of concept and product, you know, the what now we'd call the kind of product market fit, getting that validation through customers yeah. spending money, through that model before you start to spend money on advertising and all those sorts of things. And so I'd say that particularly with Spider Gap, we took too long to do that, and it probably took us two years um, before we really found ah, this is this is the right market, this is the right offering um and and pivoted in a big way uh to to address that i said the other thing the other mistake that we made was um it's a weird one not hiring early enough but then um because but partly because we'd have learned faster on how not to do it because we then made lots of mistakes when we did then hire um including um not being clear enough on the uh, your expected results out of the employees and, and tracking that from uh, early on um, but also not providing sufficient guidance, processes, role onboarding, and and so on. And it meant that even though we were bringing in experienced people, like my first sales hire was someone who had done a million pounds of revenue in the previous year uh, for a similar product. And so, you know, we brought them in expecting incredible results. And what happened? They couldn't even get the results I was getting. And so we realized it's because... They had come from a business with all the processes, the collateral, the the funnel, like all of that stuff in place. And it wasn't just their skills and experience that was able to get those results. So um, so that was the thing that we then improved the next time around. Although we still didn't then get it right, because then one of the things that uh, we did a good job of making sure that our next sales hire would get results. But um, she wasn't really well, like engaged, supported, managed, empowered, you know, shown that we value uh, her enough. And as a result, although she was getting results for us, um, after 11 months, she handed in a notice. And so um, and I remember that being really painful because, you know, it felt like we're back to square one. Um, but the, the yeah. thing it taught us there is that you actually need your processes and things in place to make sure that you're yeah. checking in and, and, and uh, processes, but also meeting with them to make sure that you're checking in with your team and that you're supporting them and that you're providing them with them with personal development and supporting their growth and uh, that you're appreciating them and um, uh, demonstrating alignment with your values and all those that kind of good stuff that particularly if you're someone like me who that doesn't just all come naturally to me. I don't. I don't automatically think, oh, well, I'll catch up with Julia and just see how she is and check on, you know, how that house move got went. Like my brain doesn't offer that up to me. So I have I have a weekly one to one check in in my diary and I have some one to one notes that I refer to to help me remember those things. And that's just a little system, a little process, uh, you know, meeting with them that helps me make sure that I do the things that actually really matter to people. And so. As a result, we've we've built up that that culture. But yeah, I, the span of those lessons, I'm talking six, seven years. Um, so ah, it's been painful to take that long to do it. Whereas now, yeah. you know, we the business, like the clients that we work with through Air Manual, we're helping them set that up in weeks. So it's <laughs> um, yeah, it it was painful at the time, but I'm glad we went through it because arguably it puts yeah. us in a really good position to, to help others. Yeah. Makes sense. All right. Well, that's the perfect segue into the next question. How did Air Manual get its first 10 customers? Yeah. So um, so because I learned uh, the hard way uh, that you don't do it by going, right, we're going to do some Facebook and, ad and Google ads um, and we'll see what comes through and then we'll like optimize. Uh, instead, what we did was went through, uh, we got clear on who do we think we want to help? What do we want to help them to do? Um, and uh, and how are we going to do that? And then uh, found ways to reach those people through people we already knew. So in some cases we knew, you know, we had already got direct relationships. In other cases, I would speak to people and say, "Hey, I'm looking to speak to people who X." And um, the key is that those initial conversations, I'm not looking to sell. I'm looking to learn. I'm looking to understand. Okay. Like, is this even a problem that you have? So, for example, uh, for Air Manual, we would say, right, we want to help business leaders 
typically six figure, seven figure revenue, but sometimes larger. Um, and help, we want to help them to free up their time. We want to help them to reduce the stress of running the business and ultimately unlock growth. And, uh, we believe that the challenges that they've got relate around, uh, their processes and their onboarding and so on. Although <laughs> I'm saying this now, like it was not as clearly formed back when we started, uh, and it was broader and all these sorts of things. But let's, let's say that I was smarter back then <laughs> than I actually was and that I had, I had got that. I would be saying to people like yourself, Scott, I'd say, okay, Scott, um, you know, you, you probably know some business leaders who are in a, who are looking to grow, uh, but they're, you know, they're working all hours. They're finding business stressful. Maybe, maybe they're hiring loads of people and they just find training like painful. Um, I'm looking to learn about the sorts of challenges that those business leaders are hitting, like what the impact of that is, what solutions they're using, what's working, what's not. Um, who would you recommend I talk to? And most people will say, oh, yeah, I can think of a couple or I can connect you to this person. And then you have conversations and you literally just ask questions to understand the pain. But the crucial thing, and um, there's a book uh, called The Mom Test, uh, which does a really good job of giving you a structure on how to do this, like asking questions to understand, is there a real pain point here that people are willing to spend money on? Because um, the temptation as an entrepreneur, uh, and, and particularly, I think, for a SaaS founder, because you imagine that you've got this incredible scalable good business, is to come up with this amazing idea um, and and as a result, just seek for ways to validate it. Like, you know, we think, oh, yeah, our product market fit, I need to validate there's a need. The problem is if you go out there saying, hey, do you have this need? Like, they'll probably go, oh, yeah, no, that sounds good. And you go, great, that's that's one tick. And of course, the reality is, is if you then ask questions and say, well, so how are you solving that currently? It's like, ah, I'm not. It's like, oh, and, and again, an entrepreneur, uh, some entrepreneurs might think, oh, fantastic. There's an unmet need. It's like, well, have you looked for a solution to this? No. Okay. Are you spending any money on trying to solve this currently? No. You know, have you, <laughs> like, if there was a solution and you, but you had to do a little bit of effort, would you, would you go for it? Like, you start to realize that maybe the problem that you're looking to solve isn't painful enough that someone's willing to spend money on it. And so um, mm. certainly in the early days of, frankly, all of my businesses, that's where we started. And it's only through pivoting by asking better questions, more open questions about what, as a, for example, as a business leader, what are some of the biggest challenges that, you, that you're that you currently facing or that you've had to overcome recently or, um, uh, yeah. and, or that you're currently looking for solutions to, that you start to really dig into where is the pain? What are people really getting hurt by? What do they want to spend? What are they willing to spend time and money on solving? Um, and for us, even more recently, we talk about life changing goals. You know, what, what are what are the life changing goals that people are trying to achieve? And then the more that we can tap into solving those, um, the more potential there is for the business. So so that's what we did initially is have all those conversations. And then when they initially they don't go that well, <laughs> you, you know, you identify that there isn't a real need there. Um, but eventually, once you iterate a few times, you start into conversations where you're able to describe the pain point better than the. Uh, that the other person is and, and you and so they'll say something and you'll summarize it back in in a way that you've kind of built based on the conversation they go oh, yes that's exactly it and then you get to a point where you can articulate how you're going to add value and they go oh that would be awesome and then you get into this awkward situation because they're almost like and is that available and of course the answer is no <laughs> i haven't even started on it or you know i've got a prototype in excel or you know mock something up but you have those yeah. conversations and, and and you essentially yeah. if it did exist what's the you know highest price that uh what, what what price would it be too expensive or what price would it would you think it'd be so cheap you'd worry about the quality or what price would it be just about affordable um and at what price what do you feel would be the maximum that you'd be able to pay like and and then get some initial customers kind of either actually paying or at the very you know properly signed up where they're committed that if you create this it's going to do it and then you know you've got some initial customers you've got the product market fit and and then, well, or at least you've got a market fit and then you can develop a product and hopefully you can deliver on what you've promised. Uh, and if you can, yeah. you've got business. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's pivot a little bit and um, you can tell me a little bit about the air manual product and how it works. And if you want to go into spider gap as well, then that's fine. 
Yeah, I think uh, uh, so at a high level, uh, you know, for, for Spider Gap, for example, that's all about employee development. It's how do you support your team in getting clear on where they need to prioritize their improvement and do so by using uh, 360 feedback. So getting feedback from their manager, their peers, their direct reports and their own view, providing them with a simple report that really helps them to prioritize what do they need to work on. Um, and that's really powerful. You know, I was speaking to a business leader yesterday who um, he was actually asked the question by his coach uh, of a team member that he felt like maybe we need to get rid of. He was asked, you know, what, what would other people say about it, this particular employee? And they said, I've got no idea. And of course, it's like it's actually quite useful to have that that view. Um, but it's also really useful for the, for the employee to have that view so that they can prioritize their improvement and, and drive forward. So that's, you know, that's a business that now um uh, works with over 500 organizations around the world, including well-known brands like 3M and PwC and Swarovski and Pepsi and so on, um, and has grown mm -hmm. in over a number of years. Air Manual is, is newer. We're currently working with, uh, I think, around 50 to 60 uh, businesses. And, and with that, we're helping them to, to free up their time, to, to reduce the stress, to improve consistency, remove key person dependencies so that, you know, like I, like I did earlier this year, I can, you can spend six weeks out of the business. And the way that we do that is firstly, there's kind of, um, there's the product, there's the, the tool itself, the SaaS uh, side of the business, which provides a frictionless way for the whole team, lead, you know, leaders, but also employees to be able to, um, capture, document processes and policies and onboarding and so on in a really simple uh, way that's really quick, like in, in a few minutes rather than hours, which is what people most you know, generally spend in Word and all that kind of stuff, but also to use those processes and use them as interactive checklists. So it's easy to follow. It's easy if you go away and you can come back, you can find the checklist that you're working on where, and where you're at. You can pick up where you, can, where you left off. Um, uh, everything's kind of concertinas nicely, so you don't have a situation where yeah. um, you're having to look at this enormous 72-page Word document. It's just taking to the bit that you need. Um, but also, crucially, you can make improvements and tweaks really, really quickly. So if you get to a particular step and you make a mistake or you've got a question, you can resolve that, work out what should change in the process, click edit, make the change, publish, you're done. Um, and that's really important for continuous improvement. You don't want it to be an action that you maybe pick up later. Um, it needs to be live because otherwise you just end up with a pile of processes and Word docs and Loom videos and all sorts of different things that never get updated and everything goes out to date. The other thing that yeah. we provide uh, that we've recently uh, started to provide customers in Air Manual is um, a process dashboard. So what this does is it basically takes all that documentation that you've got and enables you to see okay, who owns each of these processes? How often does it need doing? When was it last done there for? When is it overdue? If it is, um, it'll like show up red and you can see, you know, who needs to do it and so on. And, and they can you know, follow the checklist to get it done. But what this does is it makes managing the business easy. Suddenly it's not mm. tricky or time consuming to uh, work out that, oh, you haven't renewed your business insurance um, for, you know, uh, for for the coming year. Um, real story of something I did. Terrifying when my accountant said, huh, I can't see the expense line for your insurance. It's like, oh, oh, God, like, we, that's because we haven't paid for it. We haven't renewed. Um, and there are m numerous examples in my business where I've easily spent five figures um, I suspect in some cases getting close to six figures on individual mistakes or dropped balls. Um, and, you know, that's yeah. not even speak of repeated mistakes, for example, failing to ask customers, you know, who are the state, who else needs to be involved in this, you know, in this sales conversation or um, asking them, you know, how many employees have you got or whatever, like those things, if you don't have in your sales process and it's uh, assuming it's relevant uh, for the type of project you've got, like that costs easily hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars over time because um, you're, you're kind of missing those opportunities. So what's powerful is making sure that you embed that in. Um, and so as I say, like we provide the tool, but we also provide consulting uh, to customers to help them implement this super fast. Because some of the business owners we work with, they're literally working seven days a week or um, their head is just so full of the stress and the firefighting that they don't know where to start or that they've got um, a team of people who have maybe tried to sort out processes in the past and, and it's failed or it's, you know, it's become a tick box exercise or it's become 
um, just mm. a pile of yeah. stale documents and they don't know a better way. And so, you know, we support them in, in kind of sorting that out. And it's, uh, it's so rewarding, right? Because we are helping them achieve life-changing goals. We're helping them be able to take their first holiday in five years or, um, or, or be able to spend their weekends with their families or be able to step out of the business when, um, sadly, they have a, um, a father that passes away and as a result, and yet onboarding and so on of new team members can still happen without them. You know, these real examples. Um, and that's just, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's life changing stuff. And I'm so proud to be part of that. So the consulting would be a nice, easy upsell because that'd be really useful for the customer. Yeah, it's great. It's exactly. It's, it's really useful for the customer and, you know, the way in which we price yeah. it because it's in our it's in their interest, but it's in our interest that they get value out of the, the tool that yes, become yes. an amazing case study, that they become an amazing testimonial, that they refer people and so on. Um, but also that they become a retained customer, right? Like if they've, if they've yeah. literally got a part of their business that is working really well in air manual, they're not going to, going to uh, churn. And so it's in our interest too, which means that we're able to offer it at a reduced cost versus what a normal consultant might have to charge. Um, so we can kind of make it a no brainer frankly, I would argue. Um, so that's really powerful. The other thing that's nice, because I think a lot of SaaS businesses avoid this, like, you know, if, if you're talking to a venture capital firm, they'll say, okay, what's the ARR of your business to, to ascertain its value? And they don't want to include service yeah. revenue. They won't include consulting. Um, and so as a result, as a SaaS founder, you might think, well, in which case, that's not what I should focus on. And it's true, like, you need to be working on building up your recurring revenue stream, because ultimately... Yeah. Early on, SaaS is painful because you have to spend a lot of money and time up front um, and your recurring is what kind of brings you profit later. However, here's the power of the, the consulting uh, model or, or providing services up front. Firstly, it improves your retention. Secondly, it allows you to learn because you can work out what holds back your customers and you, you, know, you realize like, oh God, why is the customer doing this? Like, you know, it's obvious that it's this button. It's like, is it? <laughs> they didn't see it as obvious. And so that allows you to learn as well. And not just like through a demo, but deep usage. Like wh what issues do power users hit? You know, at what point do they start to outgrow your tool? All those sorts of things. But the other thing that's awesome is it, um, it liquidates your, uh, leads early on. So you're, you know, if you've had to spend, uh, uh, $50, uh, $50 to get a lead, and then you're converting 10% uh, of those. So essentially you're, it's costing you $500 a customer and uh, you get $100 per customer per month. It's taking you five months to just get your marketing spend back. Never mind pay for any sales or demos or, you know, uh, support or anything like that. So, you know, really it's probably going to take eight months, maybe 10 months before you're getting to break even on that one customer you're going to need a lot of cash to be able to grow fast. Whereas mm. if you can charge the customer, let's say a thousand dollars on, in, in addition to their hundred dollars a month, um, uh, 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 renewal rate. So, you know, thousand dollars up front plus their hundred dollars a month. Suddenly you're getting all of your marketing spend that $500 back on that first person plus another $500 to pay for all the support and so on that you're going to provide them through the consulting, which means that you're getting break even on that customer essentially in month one, which means that you've got that cash recycled back into the business. That means you can invest in growth again and, and keep that going. And of course, the right. when you've got those, the more you can get those numbers right the, to the point that you are literally liquidating those customers within the first month, that's when you know rapid yeah. growth can be supported because you can yeah. just churn that right back in. Awesome. All right. So in your opinion, what's the biggest challenge new founders are experiencing right now with growing SaaS companies? I think that um, one of the challenges is that, uh, complete, uh, you know, if I, if I look back at 10, 12 years ago when I started, one of the biggest challenges was not really knowing what to do in terms of acquiring customers and testing and product market fit and so on. Now I'd say that hopefully people feel like there's a lot of guidance out there. There's great podcasts like your, your own. Uh, there's uh, many, many books and so on that are available on this topic for either free or low cost that you can get really yeah. good guidance on, on how to do it. You know, I mentioned MomTest, there's Ready, Fire, Rain, there's, um, you know, uh, The Lean right. Startup. There's all these books, there's, um, uh, you know, Lean Canvas, all these things that exist to help you to do the, uh, to, to build your business. The bit that's got tougher 
over the last decade is that the uh, the fragmentation of media and all these sorts of tools means that um, it can feel like there's so much to do. You know, if you're going to do, if you're going to decide that the way in which you're going to reach your audience is through social media, like which platform, and sometimes you're told like you need to be on all of them and, uh, and you know, to cut above, uh, to, to speak above the noise, you can't just be posting once a week. Oh, no, can't even be posting just once a day. Oh, no, it needs to be, you know, two, three, four times a, a, a day. And just as a founder in the early days, there's just no time to do that and, uh, you know, and everything else. And so I think that that's often the challenge is there just feels like there's so many things to do. And so the, the challenge is uh, working out what works and quickly turning that into something that can be delegated. But one of the the really nice things that's improved over the last 10 years, way beyond, uh, I think, even my expectations of what would happen, is the ability to take on fractional uh, support. So freelancers, VAs, you know, fractional CFOs, all those sorts of things, and do so really effectively. Like my, my companies are all, um, we're 100% remote, like I'm joining this, from my home, my new home, I moved house on Tuesday, which is why this god awful wallpaper yeah. uh, exists. It's not been taken down yet. <laughs> um, but uh, like we all work from home, and uh, uh, and yet back when I started, that was a weird, unusual thing that'd be worthy of remark at a barbecue, where all the other, uh, all, all my friends would be saying, "Oh yeah, I can't possibly imagine working at home. I'd never get anything done." Then of course COVID hits, and now everyone's like, "Huh, I'm more productive when I'm working at home." And like, like I've been saying this for years. Um, and so now that's a more common model, which means that you can get access to incredible talent out there, even if you've only got half a day's uh, a week's worth of work uh, available to do it. Yeah. And so the the potential for growth as an entrepreneur is how is basically your speed of execution in terms of how quickly can you work out what works. So like how to sell your product, how to follow up effectively, how to get leads in, how to deliver the product effectively, how to onboard your clients, how to, you know, onboard new employees, like all those things, how to, working out what works um, and systemizing that, turning it into processes and documentation and automation and getting that so that that's not on your plate so that you can then create more space for greater impact and, and go again and again and again. And I think that's the challenge and, and, uh, it's why I'm I'm absolutely adoring, love it, working in this space because often it is the it's the switch. It suddenly changes. You know, we've worked with business leaders where they go from being complete control freaks, where every single client goes through them and they do all the client onboarding and everything, to suddenly it's like, oh, they've you know they've untapped both the mindset but also the business mechanisms that means that they can empower the team and suddenly um, you know grow, but without the stress, which uh is uh is is really what we're all wanting when you're, when you're trying to build a business yeah all right what's your favorite business book i mean there are so many i've mentioned quite a few uh on on uh so far but i'd say my favorite is how will you measure your life by clayton m christensen um it's really really insightful it's uh there's you know um uh clayton's written some brilliant uh books including um, the innovators uh, dilemma and the innovator solution. Um, he is yes. a, a really super smart guy. Um, uh, but I think a lot of people don't know about the, how will you measure your life? And yet I'd say it's um, his most important work. Um, he wrote it towards the end of his life, uh, tragically. Um, but it was uh, finished uh, with, with his colleagues and, uh, and family members. And it's such an important part. And, you know, one, like just one nugget I'll share from it is that he talks about how you can imagine parts of your life as juggling balls. So, you you know, your work and your relationship with your kids and relation, like, you know, or, sorry, your, your family, um, you know, all these sorts of things. And they're, they're, you know, juggling balls. But the thing to remember is that your work one is made of rubber. And if you drop it, when you're ready, you can just pick it right back up. The family one is made of glass. Like if you drop it, you might be okay. It might just have a little scuff or maybe a little crack, but it might smash. But when you drop it and you don't look after it, the damage is done long term. It's it, it, it doesn't just bounce straight back. And so uh, the book is essentially about getting really clear about what is it that you really care about and making sure that 
as a result what you're doing in your business and, and so on is is driving towards that greater purpose you know something that uh, in other books like simon sinek start uh, you know uh, start with why and so on uh, i've done a really good job yeah. of kind of going into but yeah yeah i'd heard of the other two books that you you mentioned but not not that book so yeah that one mustn't be as well known yeah because <laughs> people are focusing on the wrong thing yeah. perhaps <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so just to wrap up, where can people go to find out more about Air Manual and Spider Gap? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, I'd, first, I, I'd recommend that people check out our podcast, De-Stress Your Business, also available at de-stressyourbusiness.com, um, which kind of goes into uh, depth in a lot of topics like how to how to get your onboarding of employees just right, you know, how to free up 15 hours a week of your time, uh, all these sorts of things, you know, how to delegate effectively. Uh, so I'd highly recommend that. Um, we also, I also run a regular webinar um, on how to free up 15 hours a week and remove the constant stress of uh, running a business without slowing down growth. Um, uh, and you can check that out at mmanual.co forward slash webinar um, to learn about the tool, mmanual.co. And of course, you can find me on social media uh, where I'm Alexis Kingsbury. Um, feel free to, you know, people can feel free to connect to me and send me messages on there. Cool. All right. Thanks for coming on the show, Alexis. I appreciate it. Oh, it's been an absolute joy. Thank you so much for having me, Scott.